I'm Elliot Stearns, and this is a continuation of our class on Hebrews. This is class two, and the theme tonight is the theme of hope in the book of Hebrews. But before we get into that, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time in review for our, uh, what we have been going over so far. In the first class, I presented the vision for this class. It's kind of a thematically set class rather than going through it verse by verse. So we have a vision. The vision was simply that we would uh, learn the book of Hebrews to a certain extent, but also celebrate it because it is a wonderful book. It's called the book of better things. The word better is used in the book 13 times to speak of a better covenant, better promises, better sacrifice, and so on there. And so if something is better than you had before, then at least you want to say, well, why? And why is it better? And what does it mean to me? And that's what we're going to be exploring here. But better than what, basically, that Paul is bringing out, of whoever the writer of Hebrews was, is it's better than the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, that the readers of this book or the listeners to this book were involved in. Some were yearning to go back to Judaism because they had become discouraged. So it's written, it's a book to the Hebrews, Hebrew Christians who had believed in Jesus, but were now reconsidering their commitment And so the writer needs to exhort them and show them how much better the new covenant is than the old covenant. The old covenant is good, but Jesus is better, right? So uh, so the vision, to see Jesus here, and if you have your notes, I'll be following along pretty closely here tonight with, uh, with scriptures and so on. The vision is to see Jesus as the beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, for God's purpose for man. Jesus fills this book, every chapter. There's, uh, I counted 50, about approximately 50 names or titles or works of Jesus that are described in this book. His titles are very well known. Let me just read some of them. This is only maybe 10 or so, but if you really study the book and say, what does it say about Jesus, who Jesus is, you'll find about 50 descriptions of him in this book, in the 13 chapters there. Jesus is the one who loves righteousness and hates iniquity. He's the one that laid the foundation of the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. He's crowned with glory and honor. And Jesus is the one for whom are all things and by whom are all things. He's the captain of our salvation. He's been made like unto us. And then he calls us his brethren. He uh, He is a merciful and faithful high priest. He's able to run to the aid of them that are being tempted. He doesn't just come to the aid. The scripture says in the Greek there, he runs to their aid. If you're being tempted and you call upon him. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. He's the great high priest, and I just love this, who can can indeed be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He doesn't have a scientific understanding. He doesn't have a bunch of facts about your your infirmities. He became man, so he feels what you can feel. He has felt that, and he knows what it is to go through what you're going through. That has to be repeated sometimes. Jesus, there is nothing that I can go through that you have not experienced and know the feeling of. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's the author of eternal salvation. He's the forerunner leading us to to coming into the very presence of the Father. He's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He's the surety of a better testament. He's the high priest of the good things to come. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He's the builder and maker of the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, and he's the author and finisher of our faith. And that's just 10 or so of the names of Jesus that you'll find in this book. It's all about Jesus. Our vision is to understand and seek the goal of God for us, for us and his church. We presented the goal here. I have it in three words here, dominion, rest, and city. First of all, he wants us to have dominion. Chapter 2 talks about taking, retaking the dominion given mandate that was given to Adam and Eve. That's described in Genesis 1 and elaborated on in Psalm 2. Who, what is man that you're mindful of him? You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to restore us to dominion. It was a given to Adam and Eve to, 
to take dominion over the earth, to make it into a paradisical place where God and man can live and walk together. Secondly, he wants us to enter into the Sabbath rest of God. The, uh, The rest is simply coming to the place of making it through the tests and trials of life to unto maturity. So it's not rest like we don't do anything. It's not rest like sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp or anything like that. It's the rest that means you've come to maturity and now you can be given real responsibility in administering the kingdom of God and and leading others into that knowledge. Moses said in Deuteronomy 12, you see the reference there, ye are not yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. And that was said in the wilderness just before coming into the promised land. The promised land, we'll look at that's why I drew the, the map here, is the, the symbol of the rest that we're supposed to come into. Plenty was done in the promised land, but that is a symbol of the rest. Thirdly, we're to enter into the holy city whose builder and maker is God, the new Jerusalem. Um, and uh, city, the word city there, or that new Jerusalem is mentioned three times in chapters 10, 11, and 12. And Abraham looked for a city who had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Uh, the city of the living God, it's called the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels that, that live there. So we have, we're seeking that, the, the city, the holy city, the rest of God, and the dominion mandate that God gave to, Abraham, uh, to Adam. I opened last week by giving a little parable from 1 Samuel 14. Won't repeat that in detail. It's just to say, again, there's a lesson there for us. Here's the story. Jonathan, King Saul's son, uh, gets the sign and goes after the enemy. I think it was the Amalekites, and he's going and conquering them. And when when Saul's camp sees what's going on, that the enemy is fleeing, the whole army goes after the Amalekites and Jonathan is out there doing, battling with his armor bearer and he sees honey on on the ground. And of course, it's a pretty strenuous thing to start conquering an enemy. And so he takes, he sits, sticks his rod into the ground, takes the honey, tastes it, and his eyes are enlightened. It says they brightened up, they were enlightened. It says there he was just he could just see things as, as never before and he was so and it, and it filled him with joy but King Saul had put an oath upon his army I don't want anybody to eat anything until we've conquered the enemy well, what does that do it just caused them to be famished so they couldn't they weren't strong they were weak they were faint and they didn't conquer the enemy as they could have had they tasted of the honey the point of this is don't let some power that doesn't know God or that some some organization or some institution some authority figure keep you from tasting the honey if you get into this book and you taste honey don't let it just say oh well I've got to find out what the commentators say about this uh, and and make it a dry study this is one of the most exciting books there is in scripture look look at again Um, if you look at verse 18 of chapter 2 there again he comes he runs to the aid of those who are being tempted because he knows exactly the kind of as I use the word feelings that we go through what a wonderful thing he wants to run to your aid he's that he's that kind of savior you should get excited about that that's why this is a intended to be a celebratory class not just a didactic one I had a conversation I taught this book maybe 10 years ago and I had a conversation with a sister, uh, someone who was at the church here at the time, and she said, what's new, Elliot? And uh, thinking, did you go on a trip? Have you done anything special? And I said, you know, the thing that's exciting me most of all is the book of Hebrews, which I'm teaching. It really, and I really meant it. That, that, was, that was the preeminent interest of my life at that time, because I, it just opened up so much of the nature of Jesus Christ to me. And I was hoping it would do the same for the class there. Again, he has suffered being tempted. He's able to run to the aid of them that are being tempted. Things like that. Those, those verses bear being chewed upon, really thought about. Lord, I know that you're there and you love me. And if there's a need that you can supply that you know I need, then you're going to run, you're going to, run to me to, to rescue me and to help me. Now the question will be, well, how come sometimes it doesn't seem like he's there? Well, we'll explore that some more, especially using this map here. Okay, now we said in the, in the review again, there are two groups of Christians being addressed in the book uh, of Hebrews. I told you already, the first group, the explicit group, is the Hebrew Christians, those who had believed in Jesus, 
but were having a hard time, persecution and so forth, and were being drawn to go back, persuaded by relations and relatives maybe and so forth. They were discouraged over certain things. They were being drawn to go back into Judaism, to go back to the Mosaic Law. And that's what the explicit uh, uh, audience is for this book. The implicit audience for this book that's, is you and me. Are we being drawn? Are we, uh, are we weary? Have we gone on so long and not seen the kind of results that we want and therefore wondering maybe I should just go back into a nice, safe, comfortable Christianity or a religiosity that will just make me comfortable. I'm a born again Christian, everything's fine. I'm going to heaven when I die and it's not that critical that I get so excited as, as Brother Elliot is here, okay? So, all right? Okay, the book has two main divisions in terms of addressing the Hebrew Christians in this book. One are encouragements that are glorious, which I just mentioned, chapter 2, verse 18, for example. And, and then there's some very, very solemn, serious, and somewhat scary warnings that are given in this book. The encouragement are the better things that the gospel has compared to the good things of Judaism and how how vastly superior walking with the Lord Jesus is, believing in him, is compared to obeying the Mosaic ordinances. We're not going to take the time on that too much right now. And the solemn warnings were that if you turn back after having once, quote, tasted the better things, if you've really embraced Christ, felt and, and been embraced by Christ, and yet you still turn away, there are some very real and undesirable consequences if that happens. And this gets into the big questions of once saved, always saved, and if I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, what difference is it making, and so forth. But these warnings are very serious, and they're in chapter 6, verses chapter 10 and chapter 12, and they need to be read, and we need to wrestle with them. As I say here, God has no plan B. <laughs> what I mean by that is if you're not going to accept what Jesus did on the cross for you and the promises he gives and the, um, and the glory of his presence in your life, and you don't want that, and you, you can't go back to Jesus and say, I want something else. That's it. That is the supreme sacrifice that was made for you and for me, and there is no other alternative to that. And so we talked about the antidote to apostasy, the antidote to to falling down and giving up or going back to a safe place. The antidote, I think the, chapter 3, verse 14, shown there, the antidote is, uh, well, I'll read the whole verse. <clears throat> we are made partakers of Christ. That means a partner. Part, uh, this is a metakos in the Greek. This means partaking of, actually joining with him, being a partner with him. Um, we're, making, we're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I, that phrase, the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, that's all important as an antidote from fall, to, from, to falling away from Christ. Because when we first came to the Lord, what did we think? Well, it sounds good to me, I guess. I'll sign on the line. No, it's not that. It was ex we were exuberant. We were excited. It was something that bubbled up within us. The joy of being forgiven. Blessed is the man whose sins, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, says David. Blessed, happy. You know, we were exultant in that. And if we keep that beginning confidence steadfast, then we stay away from the tendency to fall away. And the problem is letting things ha slack off and so the first verse of chapter 2 says, uh, consider diligently these things that I'm writing to you, lest you let them slip away. So we have to read and meditate on the scripture, continue in prayer, most of all, as we'll see. Well, the next items here, this antidote was the beginning of your confidence, one provoking one another and exhorting one another to love and good works. That word for provoke there means to poke, right? To, uh, to uh, jab at. You know, you want to you have face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact with your brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, and get, get into their, their, their life and say, I, I, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? Whatever we want. That's one way, is that we're to provoke. And the, word, the Greek word there I show, there's <clears throat> paroxymos. We get the word paroxymos, uh, uh, paroxysm, which is like a fit. That's not what we're talking about here, but it's something where we, we do not let things slide. We, we 
we jab at, we go after our brothers in love and say, well, how are you doing? What can I do to help if we have to? Secondly, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, he says there. We need to continue to stay with our brethren in the church, come whether we feel like it or not, whether we say, I didn't like last week's sermon, I don't think I want to go this week. So when, uh, <clears throat> I just noticed even yesterday in the church service, it was something I, I just had so many things I was involved in getting ready for this class and so forth. I wasn't sure, maybe I should just continue to study, but no, I came and I needed to come. I, needed, I was deeply ministered to by the sermon. I met with people that needed a lot of prayer. Uh, I just enjoyed, I, I washed myself in the fellowship and love of the saints. We need to remember the need to, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as he says, as is the manner or the habit of some. Thirdly, learn to scope out. I said the Greek word is episcopio. Right, we get the word scope or see or look at. Scope out the brethren in the church to make sure no one is falling behind or entering into bitterness and resentment. That's from chapter 10, 12, verse 15. Where uh, the writer says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest there be any root of bitterness springing up to trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So if I'm going after my brother, to, I may need to reprove, rebuke, and exhort him, not just for his sake, but also for the sake of our sister, that it, because if that takes root and it starts to exhibit itself, it's going to defile many. It's going to make the whole atmosphere uh, darker. Okay. Also in the parables of uh, Luke 15, that's the story of the lost shepherd, excuse me, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son there. Uh, remember what the, what, the, what the shepherd does is he leaves the 99 and he goes and looks for the one that's lost. That's what we need to do, and that's what the, that's what the job of a, quote, pastor is, but, but sometimes we like to make sure the pastor gets all the work, and all we can sit down and watch and, think, and, and applaud when he finds the lost sheep. Well, if you've got a church of two or 300 or 400 people, it's pretty hard to give that, that job to the pastor. It's simply our job to do the same thing. So, looking diligently, lest any man fall. Uh, the lost coin, again, the coin, this, this woman had 10 coins, she lost a coin. It was in the cracks in the pavement or something like that in the floor, that's the way the Middle Eastern houses were. They had stones that, with crevices and so forth. She lost the coin, but she looked diligently to find it. And that's your and my job is to find if someone falls through the cracks, literally, we need to go and find him and bring him up and put him back with the other nine coins and make it a complete, uh, complete fellowship. And of course, the lost son as well. Okay, we looked at those solemn warnings again uh, to, saw, uh, to try to separate what's going on there. And we must understand that we cannot just admire Jesus and say, I like Jesus, he's a great man, I think I'll call him my Savior and Lord, unless we're willing to follow him and become committed to him with all of our heart and soul. We looked at some scriptures there in John 8. John 8 said, uh, Jesus is teaching, I'm the light of the world. It says many believed in them. Then he said, hey, if you hear my word and keep my word and, and um, follow me, you'll be my disciples indeed. And, and, the, and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And did they applaud that? Did they say, wonderful? No, they suddenly turned against him. We're, we're, we're Abraham's seed. We've never been enslaved to anybody. And the very ones that said they believed, that John says believed into him, turned against him. And it's also the parable of the sower. Also, the parable of the sower says that people believed, and then the rocky soil, though, um, uh, because of the rocky soil, there was no, they didn't have any root in themselves, and therefore they withered. Or the thorny soil, the thorns grew up and choked the seed so it didn't bear fruit. You see, those things, but it does say that those people received the message. And so we have to make sure, did you receive the message because it was kind of romantically interesting to you and you liked it? Or is it something you saw your need as a sinner to be forgiven and to follow and be a disciple of Jesus with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength? So that's what we're talking about there, but we'll probably get into that a little bit more as we go on in this book. The theme of this, of this particular class, as I say, is hope. I titled it, as you see at the top of your page there, Faint Not, Hope in God. Hope is a very important subject in the scriptures. It's also very important in the book of Hebrews. And I wanted to just explore that because hope is the the basis of faith, and you know the scripture, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, 
Now, faith is the, what? Evidence of th- the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for. So the hope precedes the faith, all right? Faith provides the substance, but underneath that is the hope that lifts it up. And you'll see in the top of, the, uh, yeah, top of your notes, I just put that simple little scripture from Romans that says we are saved by hope. We come back and we say, no, I thought I was saved by faith. Well, you are saved by faith. Scripture is very explicit in that. But without the hope that your confession of, sal- of, of need and confession of the lordship of Jesus, without the hope being there, there would have been no hope for the making the confession, nothing that would motivate you to do that. So I say faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the ground of faith. And its absence makes for failure to believe and trust in the Lord. Hope is the underlayment, you might say, of faith. I was uh, doing a, an inspection I do the, for, my, for insurance this last week, and I was wondering, uh, and I was wondering why, uh, looking at the roofing for this apartment building is all nice Spanish-style roofing. And it looks like as permanent as you can possibly be, but they said no. Under that tile is an underlayment. <laughs> And that underlayment can deteriorate, and then they've got to take the tiles off and replace the underlayment. That's what's necessary. It's the same thing with faith. You say, oh, i got faith. But if the hope is started to dry up, become desiccated and all, and you're just sort of not, you're just going through the motions, it doesn't matter what your outward um, demeanor might be, the faith is going to suffer also. So as I say, it's the underlayment of faith. Now, these... This is going to be a little more technical, but let's just try to follow through and get into understanding faith in terms of hope. The uh, letter B there says the so-called heroes of faith in chapter 11 are not just believers, but who are believers that were animated each. And if you just study that chapter carefully, it's what, 50 verses long or so, all those heroes of faith. But look at each of them and see what did they actually believe? What was their faith? And I write here that they were animated by a specific and lively hope, which was a hope for something specific. Okay, that's important. It wasn't a vague, I'm going to heaven, I hope for heaven after I die. It was always they had a specific goal in mind with that exercise faith. It is interesting to look at 1 Peter 1, 3 there. I tr- in quotes there, I have the lively hope. They're animated by a lively hope. That's a hope that was alive within them. Like a, not just, uh, not just a stagnant pool of water, but a bubbling brook within them of faith. That's what Peter said there. Let's see, it's, um, he, uh, in 1 Peter 1, 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope, a hope that lives that controls us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a dynamic spring of hope. It's an irrepressible hope. It's something that just makes you dance. That kind of a hope is within us. So, and, but that's important because that has that, that's the beginning of our confidence. The beginning of our confidence, again, was a, a bubbling brook within us of, of exuberant joy. Jesus in Luke 18, 8, he asks a very important question. He asks this question of you and me, of the disciples, and he says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And literally what it means, will he find the faith on the earth? What's the faith? The faith is the kind of faith that that importunate widow in that story had. What did the importunate widow do what, what, the, the, against the unjust judge? She wouldn't let him rest until she was given justice. And so this is a matter of justice and a judge that did not fear God or or regard man or anything like that. And so he asked the question, look, if that woman had that kind of faith to go after that judge and get justice, how does that compare with me? I love you, I died for you. Do you think I'm not gonna come to your aid? The unjust judge didn't want to, but he had to in the end because she was so pressing. And if she had to press an unjust judge, and I'm a just judge and I love you, what, well, what do you lack? But then he says, he sort of 
I don't know if he paused, but he says, but when the Son of Man returns, will he find that kind of faith on earth? That those who will come to the Lord and believe that he is and trust him for things. And so, again, that's the, that hope is the ground of that. So here's the challenge, you know. Has God, and you just have to ask yourself this, has God given you either something you can't see, but so real to you that you can almost taste it, that motivates you to keep on keeping on. I don't, I don't mean a hope again for heaven after you die, but a calling, a ministry, a gift of the Holy Spirit to minister to others with. Or Do you know what God's calling you to? Do you know what you're yearning for in Christ? Let me tell you a story about me at the, at the risk of, of, this isn't the, the overriding goal of my life or anything like that. I do want to live and display uh, the kingdom of God to, to this world, to this generation, all right? That's why I want to come out. I want to be strong in that. But a year and a half ago or so, I, I was just looking at Scripture, and I said to myself, Self, you know, Bible says that God is partial to no man. And, and look at this. He can, what he can do with one person, he can do to another. Isn't that right? He's partial to no man. He can do anything he wants. And if you see it in Scripture that he did it to someone here, he can do it to someone over here, right? If he wants to. And I said, this is, well... I'm in the New Covenant, and even in the Old Covenant, Abraham and Sarah, uh, 99, was he 100 years old? Sarah's 95 or so, and he, he rejuvenates them. He brings, he, 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 he runs the clock back, makes them young again, right? And they just, and so they could enjoy relations, and then uh, she could conceive, and she could bring forth Isaac, and she could nurse him, and she, so she's totally rejuvenated. He is too. And then, uh, Caleb and Joshua, the, the exact same strength of, and youthful vigor that they had after 40 years in the wilderness, they had the same strength as before. Jo Caleb said, hey, look, I'm just as strong as I was 40 years ago, right? When Moses died, you know, it says his face was moistened, meaning he didn't look young and uh, old at all, he, despite the Ten Commandments movie, right? What's that show, Big White Beard and so forth? He, he was young, just that was his time. The Lord said, I'm going to take you now. But, he, but there was no reason he had to die at that point. Remember, he'd been on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights, didn't eat anything. He was just in the presence of the Lord, too. Right? Who else uh, was, uh, what's Psalm 103 says, uh, says he renews my youth as the eagle, or he renews your youth as the eagle, right? There, there might be other examples, too. I said, well, Lord, if you could do it to them, you can do it to me, can't you? So I said, Lord, no harm in asking. I'm just asking you to renew my youth. Okay? Now, I know you're looking at me saying, doesn't look like much has happened. Really. Okay, I know that. But the point is, you can ask, right? You can, he can do anything. The thing that, that I'm bringing this up is because um, there's, a, uh, there's a healing service once a month in Claremont. I tried to go to, or at least I did before COVID. And, uh, and they, at the end of the service, someone preaches and so forth. And they go up, and if you have need of something, you go up for prayer and and they'll, they'll pray with you. And I, so I had something or other, it was my back or whatever it, was, it might have been. I just went up for prayer and I stood up there and they prayed for me. And there's a young lady off to the side. I'd seen her, but I don't, didn't know her at all. She didn't know me. I had never had any interaction with her at all. This was just something I saw occasionally. She said, I have a Bible verse for you. I have a scripture for you. And she said, so she said the word Job, 20, Job 33, 25. I said, okay, thank you very much. So I went back to my pew and I was thinking it's going to be something about the Lord supplying my needs or something like that. I opened up and wonder what Job 33 25 says. It says his flesh shall be fresher than a child's he shall return to the days of his youth. So I said you know that's a confirmation to me that the Lord is not ignoring a prayer like that you see. But do you have a calling? Do you have something that's just I mean, 31,102 verses in the King James Bible, and she chooses the one that was, had to do with the, what I was praying at that point, you see? you see? So this is really something that we, do you have it? Everybody in, those, in that chapter 11 has a specific calling, hope. They see a city they want to see come. Whatever it might be, call to the Lord. Say, I want to know. Uh, what you want me to be, what, you, what, what your calling is for me, so that I can glorify your name in my life. Romans 10, 17, looking at the notes again, says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
The gospel message saves, brings peace, gives access by faith to God's grace with the hope of the glory of God. I'm quoting from Romans 5, 1 through 5. What Romans 5, 1 through 5 says again is having peace with God, our sins forgiven. We have access by grace into the, we have access by faith into the grace that makes us stand strong. And then he says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In other words, the hope is there for the glory of God and that motivates faith giving access to grace. And not only that, he says, we're so confident in that grace and that hope. Yeah, we're so confident in that hope that we can even rejoice in tribulation because tribulation builds experience and experience builds character and 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 character builds a hope which never makes us ashamed. There's that hope again. Because, he says, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he sent. So we need to learn what it means to have that hope that allows that faith to rise up. Letter D there. But then comes the test or dilemma. There's a very important scripture in Proverbs there. Proverbs 13, verse 12. And you all know it, probably. Hope deferred, put off not coming as fast as we'd like, hope deferred, anybody know the rest of the scripture? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. All right, so in other words, if I have a hope and I'm hoping it comes quickly and it doesn't come quickly, I can start to get weak and tired and faint and sick. Then it says, but the desi- when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Okay, so this has been the problem with the Hebrews in the book. They rejoiced, they, they had a wonderful confidence and faith in God and Jesus at the beginning of their conversion, but a hope deferred. They, always, they thought, oh, we're going to believe in Jesus and then he's going to come in glory and we're going to be with him in his kingdom and it, and it was deferred. And so they were relying on a hope they thought was coming quickly but it wasn't coming quickly and so they got sick and faint the word means there okay weak and tired someone once said life is so daily okay in other words they just it was hope deferred so their heart was getting sick but this is the exhortation of this book he who endures to the end is the one who gets saved all right and so we're going to look at that in a little more detail here Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire does come, it becomes a tree of life. What does that mean, a tree of life? I'm just sort of an excursion, I guess, but a tree is a plant that has roots that go deep in the earth and hold it stable, right? And it, and it grows, and if it's a fruit tree, it brings forth fruit, right? And others can partake of the sweetness of the strength or the strength of the tree makes for the fruit and they can be strengthened by the fruit that you bear. So in other words, it's worth waiting for to get that tree because the tree doesn't grow overnight. It takes time. It has to get deeply rooted in the earth and it grows and it has to, and it goes through winters. You know, they say an apple tree needs a good strong winter, right? You ever heard that? You know, and you need to go through things. There was a, um, in Arizona, I think I might've brought this out before. In Arizona, they made this big, uh, structure in the desert that was hermetically sealed and they put people in it they put plants and people in it and they wanted to and they want the plants to produce the oxygen and the people to breathe out carbon dioxide and it was supposed to be a self-contained unit and uh, see how see how if people colonize another planet or were in a similar container like that out in space or something if they could make it work you see and they just wanted to test human psychology and the and the balance of nature there and that type of thing. Interestingly enough, they found that when they planted trees in this, I think, I can't remember the name of it, in this big structure, uh, the trees all died. Everything was perfect. The ground was good, the water, they watered, and there was nothing to prohibit the trees from just growing and flourishing. It wasn't because of lack of of, uh, carbon dioxide or anything. Everything was balanced just perfectly, but the trees died. You know why the trees died? They found out finally. The, what? No sun? No, the sun was there. It was a, a transparent. 
Okay, the, the reason the trees died is because they didn't have any wind in this, in, this, in this structure. And it turns out, you wouldn't believe it, but trees need wind to grow. Why? Because if it bends, then that brings up the, 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 the nutrients every time they do it, like your muscles. You stretch them and then they become, and the, and the blood flows and so forth. If a tree just sits there and has no wind pressure, nothing to strain it or stress it, 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 it doesn't have the strength, it doesn't develop tree muscles, whatever the term is, to bring up the, the fluid or whatever and make the tree grow. And that's what, when the desire comes, it's like a tree of life because you have grown, you become deeply rooted, you become strong, and the winds of, of stress and strain and temptations and trials that you overcame make you strong and able to bear much fruit. But it takes time to grow a tree. And so that's why the, well, the writer of Proverbs is saying, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but be patient, hold fast. You're growing, you're getting your roots deep, and this, this, the winds of change are, are making you to grow strong. That's just a little excursion there. It says here that the Jewish believers were enthusiastic witnesses of Christ and shared the sufferings of those in prison. This is now quoting from the book. They shared the sufferings of those in prison, these Jewish believers. They accepted the confiscation of their belongings with joy because they knew that they had a better and more lasting possession. Okay? This was how enthusiastic these Jewish Christians were at one time. And yet now they're starting to wonder, do I keep on keeping on? But as I say here, the day-by-day day trek through the wilderness. Now here's why I have the map in part here. The Jews left Egypt. They crossed, this, they crossed the Red Sea. They went over into Arabia. They went through the wilderness. Eventually they come into the Promised Land. How long did it take them to go from here to here? Well, it could have been a few days, but because of murmuring and everything, it took them how long? 40 years, okay, 40 years. So this, this trek through the wilderness, hey, we just escaped Egypt, yay. What's all this sand around here, okay? So we'll look at that in a moment here. So as I say here, this trek through the wilderness filled with threats, pleadings from their relations, disappointments, figuratively, seeing the sand, just the sand. I know they just got out of Egypt, now there's more sand, right? What's going on? Well, the Lord just delivered you from Pharaoh, from a picture of Satan. You know, you're, but, but what's all this sand and this, you know, we don't have anything to drink and so on. Uh, there, was, there was no land flowing with milk and honey. What's going on here? This threatened to discourage them that caused many to think about returning to Egypt. In this case, the returning to Egypt meant going back into Mosaic law and to the Judaism to, that they were so used to. You know, they had the temple and they had all the beautiful ceremonies and the high priest garments and so forth. Everything looked so lovely there. Uh, that was what they were doing. But we have to go through the wilderness. I repeat, we have to go through the wilderness to get into the promised land. As with them, so with us. Few Christians today abandon the faith, but they too easily settle in a comfortable Christianity which demands little in terms of commitment. We don't want to do that, okay? We'd better to forsake the faith, then God can really deal with you, than to get into a lukewarm faith where he just wants to spew you out of his mouth, as Revelation puts it. Once again, and this is where it gets important for you and for me in our exercise of faith, holding on to that enthusiastic and exultant beginning of our confidence is essential to passing the tests of the school of hope in which we enroll when we first believe, or in which. This involves not only believing, but actually creating the substance of the hope for promise. Now here's what most don't understand about faith. Faith is not a mere belief. Faith is believing for something, right? It is a specific thing. And God is using us to bring to pass his will on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just automatically going to come, as I'll bring out in a minute. Faith for something to come to pass is also faith declared and confessed and acted upon to bring the promised hope to pass, or bring it, bring it about. 
Our faith words are creative and they're powerful and they are, as Hebrews 11, 1 says, substance. That's an interesting Greek word. We'll explore it right now. It's a blastosis, but it is like substance. It puts that substance into time and, and it brings to pass the purposes of God. God is using us when we say, why would he say, pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if it's just, a, if it's just poetry? It's us who effect the kingdom by our prayers. Remember the bowls of prayers that you see in the book of Revelation. We bring it to pass in faith. He looks to us to pray, to act, to speak, to proclaim, and to witness. Peter says that we have the power to hasten the Lord's return. That's a very a good scripture to look up. And he says, hasting, looking to Jesus, hasting the return of the Lord. And, and, and you explore that in the Greek, and some people say, um, hoping for the return, hoping for a, a rapid return. No, it means you hasten the coming of the Lord. The more we participate in and embrace his will and act and proclaim it, the faster he can come, right? We can hasten it. And so I underline this sentence, the hope for a future is not just something that will come to, come to us, it is something in which and of which we play a part in bringing to pass. If the promise tarries, we are told in Habakkuk, wait for it, or it will surely come, it will not tarry. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but don't let that happen. Wait for it, it will come, though it tarry. And remember in Luke 12, what the man in the householder says, my Lord delays his coming, okay? And then he's going to come in an hour which you not, do not think about so the Lord is doing two things simultaneously. He's preparing the world for the new thing that he wants to do through our prayers, and he's preparing us to be inhabitants or citizens of that new world or that, new, that kingdom that he's preparing. So he looks to us to affect things. I was reading a, a book a while ago, a year, at least a year ago, maybe two years ago, where they're talking about Nazi Germany. No, no, not Nazi Germany, but Germany right after World War I, and, or maybe it was before, before or after, but anyway, the Pentecostal renewal had, or um, Azusa Street renewal, Pentecostal renewal had started here in America, Azusa Street, 1906. You remember that story, probably. And eventually it made its way to Germany and was introduced to the churches in Germany. And remember, there's an official national church there, and then there's the Catholic church, too. But they all said, no, we don't want anything to do with the Holy Spirit and all these gifts and miracles and signs and wonders. We don't want to have anything to do with tongues and all of that. No, no, no. And they basically quenched the Spirit, literally. <laughs> and, they may, and so the Pentecostal renewal never started in Germany. And I asked myself, and, and the writer was saying, what, had, what would have happened to Germany? Would Hitler have come up if the church had embraced the Holy Spirit's move, people praying, and... and the, and the revival taking place there in the church rather than just the state old or, or the organized church having control there would have Germany have really become the nation that became under Adolf Hitler had the people embraced it and so here we're looking now to keep praying <laughs> not letting the spirit get quenched we don't want it we in fact we want this church to grow and grace and knowledge of God and and for revival to break through amen the Lord is doing those two things so okay uh, and again, you may think, if God wants to do something, why doesn't he just do it? After all, he's sovereign. Well, here's this, there's a scripture that tells you the answer to that. It says this, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Okay? He's given, he's in charge of heaven. And you can say, yes, all authority and power is his on earth too. But he has chosen sovereignly to work through his people. Why? Well, that matures his people, gives them authority to, gives them wisdom, so when he does act to bring to pass his kingdom on earth, his will on earth as it is in heaven, you're prepared and strong and mature to, to exercise that, to take dominion. He uses you and me for his purposes in the earth. We see in Hebrews 11.3 that and this is a very important scripture, and if you're looking at it, it's written here, but I want to just 
I'll read it as, as Hebrews 11.3 says, basically in the King James, but then you'll see the part I have in brackets there, okay? By faith, we understand that the, King James says world, but it's really the ages, have been framed by the word of God so that what is seen does not owe its existence to the things which are visible. What that is saying, that is one of the most remarkable verses. And I've always loved this verse. What he's basically saying is because of faith, history is framed, ordered, and fitted and determined by faith. In other words, we just think things are rolling along, things are going to happen as they happen, cause and effect. So here's a cause that comes, and it's going to have a certain effect. But God doesn't want it to have that effect because it's negative or hurtful. So I see the cause coming and I hear the voice of the Lord saying, pray against that cause so that it doesn't have that effect. All right? And so I say, cause the Lord rebuke you or whatever it might be. Effect never happens. I just changed history. Okay? So what he's saying here is by faith, we understand that the ages are framed, that's pretty good translation, are fitted, are determined by faith. How? Well, by the word of God. He speaks to me. He says, address that cause. And so I, I, I prophesy against it or I pray against it or whatever. So that what is seen to be coming, that cause is irresistible. What can stop it? God says, my word can stop it. If you will just be my instrument on earth, remember I'm working through you, I can stop that from happening. So that what is seen does not owe its existence to the things which appear to be visible which are, or irresistible. I can stop what's going to come to pass. Moreover, the Lord will say over here, there's a dry land. People are, are sort of uh, um, dull. They don't, they, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not too enthusiastic and so forth. Pray for revival to follow here. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon the church there. Okay, so not only... Do I stop something? I can actually, by prayer, start something. I say, Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon the Hoya Christian Fellowship now, whatever it might be. Not, not that Hoya Christian Fellowship is, is needs it, I mean, but, but maybe it does. But anyway, we just pray for the, the glory of God to come. Okay? I mean, you understand that? That's, this is an exciting, exciting verse. You create history with the substance of your prayers. And so I'll talk about Noah there, number two. Uh, number three, jump to number three, Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Again, we have here the understanding that explicitly given in scripture that he chooses us to minister to the world. And he acts according to what he can deliver to a person who has ears to hear and can speak it forth. In a very poignant scripture there in, uh, in Ezekiel 22 says, I looked for a man to make up the hedge, to stand in the gap and make up the hedge that I wouldn't destroy the land, and I found no one. Okay? He, he looked for someone and he couldn't find anybody, and so the judgments had to come upon the land. So this shows again that he is looking to us. He's hoping, if I can use that term, for us to say, Lord, like what did Samuel say? I'm your servant, speak, right? Whatever, Here, listen, speak for your servant is listening. He wants us to say that to him. I'll skip number four here because of the time. Um, Isaiah prophesied that Israel would become blind, deaf, and dumb. They would not understand the words of the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus had to speak in parables and they couldn't understand and therefore uh, the Jews crucified Jesus, but that allowed for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. You see the power of the prophetic word that goes forth there. Last paragraph, letter H there. Uh, I'm going to keep you just a few minutes longer than normal, okay? Hopefully we can now begin to comprehend why it is so important not to look back or leave off from a devoted following after Christ. We must believe his promises, not just believe them, but more than that, speak them, confessing the substance of those promises into time and effecting God's will upon the earth. The Jewish Christians, the writer of Hebrews is so concerned about are not challenged to forsake a bad thing for a good thing, 
but a good thing for a better thing, a shadow for the substance, a foreshadowing for the fulfillment. In Psalm 45, the king tells his bride, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord and worship thou him. This is the psalm which talks about a royal wedding. And it says, the king desires the beauty of this queen. The queen's brought to him in gold of Ophir. And it says in the King James, she's all glorious within. And he loves her and she loves him. And he, but he admonishes her, just what I read there. He says to this queen, forget your own people. Forget your father's house. So, meaning in that way, the king will greatly desire for thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. He's not saying that she had a bad house. She had bad preparation. The Jews had a good preparation for the coming of the Lord, in the Mosaic law and so forth. It was good in its place. But the Lord is saying the same thing to the Jews, the Christian Jews who were thinking of forsaking Christianity. Look, forget your father's house, because what I have is a better thing for you. Imagine if the bride of of the king, I said that here, uh, just as foolish as it would be for a new bride of a great and good and glorious king to pine for her old home, so was it foolish for Christians to turn from so great salvation being offered to the weak and beggarly elements of their previous life. We must not turn back. We must not go back into Egypt. I want you just to see briefly here, and we'll They came out of Egypt, and they had to go through two bodies of water. The first they had to cross, the Jews had to cross the Red Sea and go into Arabia here, right? Then they went 40 years in the wilderness, and then they crossed the, what, Jordan River, went into the Promised Land. They get out, and that speaks of two disciplines. One is, when when you cross the Red Sea, you're delivered from Satan. Pharaoh represents Satan. Egypt represents the world. You're delivered from Satan. But that doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Then you have to go in the wilderness. Here, you're delivered from Satan. Here in the wilderness, what are you delivered from? Self. All right? The old man. The the fleshly desires. All right? They murmured, 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 murmured. The second generation finally came up. They go across the Jordan. They're circumcised. Now they're in the promised land. They were delivered from Satan, but now they're delivered from themselves, symbolically speaking. From their, they've taken up their cross. They're following the Lord. They've laid down their lives. They're hating their life in this world to enjoy life with Jesus. And that's what the second crossing represents. And so that's really the important thing. A few years ago, uh, some years back in the 1980s, I think, uh, was discussing in the church fellowship I was in about how many Christians do go back in the world, how many really enjoy going back into the world and becoming basically worldly again. And it made me think, what would happen if some of the Jews in Moses's, uh, Moses's uh, entourage, or the people, the Jews that left Egypt, what if they had gone back to Egypt? And so I created kind of a um, imaginative poem to describe that. You ready to listen to this just for a moment here? Then we'll be done. I call this Goshen Reborn. It says, One night I laid me down to sleep, and I dreamed a dream I must repeat. I visioned me in Egypt's land, and lo, there came a caravan. T'was Jews from out of Moses' ranks returning to the Nile's banks. It couldn't be. It couldn't be, but there they were, plain to see. I strode up to the leading Jew, demanding whence this retinue. He answered with a forceful stare, We're not going to stay out there. That Moses, well, he's much too hard. He only took us out to starve. The wives were crying, the children whined. All night we heard the moaning kind. I have no doubt that soon we'd die, and that I could not justify. So we've come back. We'll settle down. Rebuild our lives, rebuild our town. Here, living was hard, we must admit, but better than with that counterfeit. But what of the king? I said now in awe, as I said, I, I said as I gaped, what of Pharaoh from whom you escaped? 
Uh, now, don't do worry. He won't attack. In fact, it was he who invited us back. Invited you back? I said now in awe. But he's the one who canceled the straw. Yes, but that's all behind. See, he sent us a letter filled with promised assurance that our chains he'd unfetter. So we talked it all over and a motion was passed. We decided to come back to Goshen en masse. Of course, there's still some in the wilderness, some in the desert, a fanatical few who will die in the waste as they seek to pass through. But let them all die. We've our future assured. We'll pay all our taxes and obey Pharaoh's word. That's all that he asked. What could be better for us? And we get all the leaks that we want as a plus. But there's one thing more. Let this thought give you cheer. If we settle in Egypt, our gospel they'll hear. And the life that we live and the word that we speak will bring this base land to a spiritual peak. So they settled on down and built churches with spires, established employment, and sang in the choirs. And at that I awoke, and I wondered aloud of the fate of all those who their call disavowed. So the next night I laid me down early to sleep and dreamed yet another dream I must repeat. Again, I in Egypt, and from north came a sword in the hand of a horrible and mighty horde, and it swayed through the land with a horrible doom, and the fear, air of hatred, and death filled my room. And I looked unto Goshen and cried in dismay, Lord, your children in Goshen, what now, what have they? What children? Was all that I heard my Lord say. The end. Let's have a closing prayer. Lord Jesus, we do not want to be like those who draw back, but we want to be those that believe to the saving of our souls. Lead us to grow like that tree, the tree of life, O Lord, to bring forth fruit. Give us that beautiful, bright, and holy vision you have for us personally, that we might seek it with all of our heart and go and possess the land and Give glory to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.